Anthony's had an extraordinary career to date. I mean, in this city alone, I was thinking, Anthony, you've shown at the Whitechapel, the Haywood, the Royal Academy. I was thinking that the Haywood exhibition, uh, it was amazing work there called Blind Light, that went to the Pinchuk Art Centre in Kiev. And um, I was wondering what had happened to it. And um, our thoughts are with our colleagues from that institution, the Pinchuk Art Centre, who were such great colleagues in supporting that exhibition and many others. Mm. You've also shown extensively in what I lazily call the public realm, but let's call it the world beyond the gallery. Uh, from the Australian desert to Crosby Beach near Liverpool. You've had work that engages with the cityscapes, the skylines of London, New York, Hong Kong, Brasilia, Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, and so it goes on. One of the things I'd like to talk about later with you in the time we have is creative momentum. But let's start, because we've just heard an inspiring tale from a career that's just about to begin and that's got that momentum. Where, where did it all start for you, Anthony? Do you, when, when did you realize that you were feasibly a creative being who could actually do that for the rest of your life? It's so lovely to be here. It's so fantastic that we're talking about this in a time when we're, well, governed, so-called governed by, by a, a group of twits that don't seem to realize that actually making things is a form of thinking, it's a form of being, it's something that we really need and I just can't bear it that, uh, you know, somehow teaching to test has become the norm. Um, and I, I have to say in answer to your question, Tim, that, that you know, I, if I hadn't had somebody at school that took an interest in what I was, I, I, I can remember at, at, at the junior school, you know, I was making stuff just out of clay and I, we, we didn't have a kiln, so I had to, in a way, to finish it, I would paint it with, I'd paint them with emulsion paint. Um, actually, I'd forgotten that I even did that, but it was, <laughs> uh, it was, it was just that thing, I think, of getting significant others that actually weren't my parents, even though my parents were quite supportive. But anyway, pe people to take, well, this, I suppose, need that I had to, to do things, to make things seriously. And I think the, 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 the most important single significant other for me at school was was John Bunting, who happened to be a sculptor, and he, yeah, he ran the the art the art room. It was called the art room. It was right in the middle of the school, and he took himself seriously. He was a he was an artist who who did his work every day, and he'd come in and he'd be covered in little bits of elm chipping from the latest carving that he'd been doing. And he embodied this truth that you don't actually have to be a lawyer, a banker, a doctor. Uh, you can be something else. You can be somebody that decides what they're going to make, how they're going to make it, what they're going to make it out of, where they're going to make it. Uh, and in a sense, that, that example for me, yeah, I, I mean, probably only at this perspective was a really important thing to establish really early on, that actually the life of an artist is a real life. And um, he was fantastic, John, because it wasn't just the fact that he... We used to have drawing classes on, on, on Wednesday afternoons, and that was special because it was about, yeah, not, it wasn't about learning what somebody else had said or what, you know, Caesar had done in Gaul. It was about looking and then trying to register the way things looked by marks on a piece of paper. Anyway, he was, he was a real sticker. 
draw from the shoulder, Gormley. Gormley, hold your pencil straight, straight. You've got to hold it steady with your thumb. And uh, anyway, all that. I, that's not the way I draw now. But anyway, it was a, it was a, it was an amazing thing. If you can imagine, like being in this dusty old classroom, that suddenly it's something else. There's light coming through these big windows. You can see the dust motes in the air. But everybody's still. All you can hear is the scratch, scratch, scratch of pencils, and it lasts for two hours. And the things you, you the things you ask to draw are completely nuts. You know, there's a kind of bending head next to a bust of Dante with on a. Or they always put gingham tablecloths, which really kind of yeah screw you right up because of all the perspective. Anyway, the, the, the so he would he, he would do that. But then he would also say, hey, hey, Gormley, you should read this. And he'd, he'd kind of give us a copy of Wasteland. And then he'd give us a copy of Ezra Pound's Cantos. So he was, he was sharing his passions, his life, and his abilities. So, he, yeah, he would always be correcting. It was a bit annoying to have him come over and sort of correct the way that I'd done the top lid of Dante's right eyeball um, but there was something really generous ab about that the fact that he was a man who had his own stuff to do he was passionate about it but he was prepared to yeah spend time with you know little nippers and uh, even wash up our poster paint palettes you know, when the bell went and we hadn't quite stopped in time. I love the fact you still resent he corrected your Dante eyeballs. But, <laughs> um, yet, when you went to university, you studied archaeology, anthropology, art history. So the first degree was still, I mean, brilliant subjects, um, but not art. That came later as a, as a profession. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I'm a, you look at the summer exhibition every year, I'm heartened by the fact that people all around the country feel compelled to make art, and not everyone has the possibility of making a career out of art, but they still do it. But it's interesting that your first, you know, the, the, your first foray into tertiary education wasn't, art, wasn't the creative side of art. Yeah, um... You've got to be pretty confident, haven't you? And there are people who are like that. There are people who knew at the age of five, yeah, I'm going to be a musician, I'm, yeah, or I'm going to be an amazing cricketer or whatever. But I didn't have that. I was too interested in too many things. And I think it took a long time to realize that I was an artist, really by sort of process of elimination because I wasn't anything else. and um, <laughs> Don't let this put uh, you off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd love to be able to say I knew exactly, you know, I could see, <laughs> I could see my path, because uh, I, I, I've got maybe too much curiosity. Anyway, I was jolly lucky. I mean, on, on the whole, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't know. Yes, I, I, I got the art prize twice at school that was very encouraging and even at 13 even at 13 no that was a, that was amazing actually Abby for you I mean uh, that um, Father Peter who was the head of the junior school um, in yeah I must have been 13 he said Gormley there's a there's a wall down there at the end of the corridor to the new wing um, do you think you could paint something on it for us uh, and and um, and I did uh, with a with a with a with a mate. Um, it was very very bad, but it doesn't matter. It was sort of a cow and a and a and a and a, and a, and a mill and a tree. Um, but anyway, that that was amazing, wasn't it? I mean, just at that age, the, the, you know, school particular smell, you know, long corridors. In a way, definitely not home, something else, school. But then to be offered the opportunity of like, well, I mean, the equivalent of graffiti really, but legal, on this, 
on this wall that everybody was going to see. And that, in a way, changed, changed that little bit of the world. And that was, that was important. That, that was important. But anyway, sorry, this is a, I'm digressing. Because really, what, the point was that I didn't have the confidence to say, I know I want to go to art school, because I hadn't been anywhere near an art school. And uh, anyway, it was one of those things. It's like people going for jobs these days. So, well, you know, I thought I'd give it a go. So they said, why don't you go for Cambridge? So I thought I'd give it a go. And then lo and behold, they give me a place. That was a bit terrifying. But then I went. And actually, it was amazing to do Arcanant. Um, Prince Charles was there at the same time as me, and he did the same. So it was sort of for dummies, really. But 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 uh, it was an amazing course, an amazing course. Suddenly, you know, on Mondays we had to watch, um, yeah, sort of films like Nanook of the North or that wonderful film that Bertrand Russell's wife made about crossing the Oxus on inflated, um, uh, yeah, sheep bladders. I mean, amazing. Anyway, um, it was a very good opportunity to think about your own culture in the light of many others. And uh, that combination, the combination of physical and social anthropology, you know, reading Levi Strauss's Savage Mind or, or Le Don, um, you know, seminal texts that invite, in a way, uh, somebody with a rather perhaps kind of classical education to look at other ways of thinking and being and doing. And then anyway, arriving in Cambridge in 1968, you know, drug, sex, and revolution, really. We occupied the Senate House. We got, got women admitted. I mean, it just sounds ridiculous, but that was the Dark Ages. That's what it was like. But anyway, it was a good time to be there. You went there later, but it was probably a good time for you. No, it, wasn't. it was. Um, All the battles have been fought. It was dull, actually. <laughs> no, but 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 anyway, it it, it it was it was brilliant. And then and then, so my first long vacation, 1969. Where do I want to go? Go to India. Go straight to India because um, I sort of got obsessed with India. But then that's what all hippies did, and I was a good hippie because that was the other thing you had to do in 1968, 69. I came back with the Afghan coat and the long hair and, uh, you know, all of that. Um, but it was actually a time, the, the, the Duke of Gloucester had given his house in Mill Lane to be an arts lab. Michael Craig Martin, Mark Lancaster had arrived as artist in residence. It was a similar kind of experience to meeting John Bunting. Here were people who, you know, knew Richard Hamilton and and uh, Hockney and uh, gave amazing parties and had interesting friends who uh, liked the music of John Cage. We were, everybody was making films and uh, and everybody was making art, and so was I. And so it was an extraordinary sort of mixture. We had. Yeah, we had our essays to write and we had our lectures to go to. But there was, in a sense, this rising sense of youth having a voice, of the world actually changing very radically. There were so many Vietnam uh, kind of draft dodgers at Cambridge at the time and this sense of a... Of a being close to 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 a, another kind of America. Anyway, with all of that, I think um, there was enormous resources for me, uh, and I still I still uh, I, I mean to to have done anthropology and then the history of art before going to art school was a a pretty good uh, foundation course actually. I, I think being that curious and having that openness to things makes you and or would make individuals better artists. I, I, absolutely. There's a kind of openness to many, many things. And if you look at the work you've made over the last 40 years, I mean, there's everything from astrophysics to chaos theory to mysticism to um, engineering. All these things, are, they, they play into it. They're, they're, they're necessary. But I suppose there is a core to your work, which is 
humanity, the, literally in the human figure and the space that a figure has occupied or has once occupied. Um, and in a way, the consistency of that, coupled with the kind of range of context and, and, and material, um, is really interesting. So, and, it, and that is, that is unflinching. Do you think um, the world that you've just described in the late 60s and the world that we inhabit now in this country fundamentally views creativity differently? Or do you think we're still stuck with the same broadly speaking, establishment prejudices? Because although I don't want to be an apologist for you know, the current state of affairs, more people go to art galleries and museums, more people allegedly are engaged in, in creative lives. Um, where, where do you, where, how do you think the, the differences are? Am I, am I too optimistic? I don't know. The, the, I mean, it'd be interesting to ask you a lot. You know, just think about w w what we value um, and I mean, I think I, I I just think that art has, on the one hand, gained from this extraordinary, um, you could say, process of evolution within our culture here. That we, we were way behind, you know, Germany and France in terms of integrating art into, as it were, common experience. So the whole the Fondation Régionale d'Art Contemporain in France, or the, the, whole, the whole tradition of Kunsthallers and Kunstvereins in Germany, it took us you know, much longer, because they, they, they existed between the wars, between the Weimar Republic and the rise of National Socialism. Um, but it was Maynard Keynes and, and, and his, in a way, I think understanding of kind of the well, we had William Morris and the arts and crafts movement and all of that, but the but the real you know, if you if you think about the the growth of art, sixties uh, art schools in Britain, yeah. I mean, I, I'm thinking of the you know time when Hamilton was teaching at Newcastle, and I think they were you know extraordinary extraordinary whether it's Coldstream or Lawrence going extraordinary like really lively people thinking about art but um and 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 instigating its support and uh yeah uh influence but it's become i mean it's, if we think about the difference between then and now say 1970 and now, so 50 years ago, the the you know, art has become institutionalized, commodified, and in a way made into a specialism that I think it it wasn't, and I I don't want to be nostalgic about the time when. In a way, there weren't any collectors in in London. You know, when I mean the rise of Charles Saatchi and the Boundary Road Gallery, that was such an extraordinary moment. Uh, but there was something about making work for your peers, which was true in the yeah the seventies, um, and in a sense, making art, because that was something that you had to do. And now, where, where if you haven't got a gallery by the time you leave art school, you're a failure. I mean, which seems to me extraordinary, because I never, I mean, I, I'm, I find it slightly odd that I'm sitting on a podium here talking to you as if I know what I'm talking about. But the, 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 the fact is that, that um, I never really thought that I was going to live by selling my work. I, I sort of assumed that I would teach or, you know, um, yeah, maybe, maybe sell a bit of work to maybe the odd museum. Um, but that, anyway, it's an extraordinary thing, you know, the creation of this amazing Yeah, uh, no, it is, but it, I mean, it's, you're still at the pinnacle and there's still, there are many more people, I say like you, but there are many more successful artists who can make a living out of it. But, I mean, 
having gone into the field of design, but still keeping a foot in the art world and design being quite promiscuous and collaborative anyway, one of the things I'm struck by is the fact that very few people spend their time designing in private studios or bedrooms for their lives, and then it's discovered later. If you design, you, you, you need to work collaboratively or on commi with commissions or, or industry. Many people, whatever the motivations, make art, and they show them in the summer exhibition, or they have no recognition they can be rediscovered, and they can be discovered in later life. I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing, but it happens, and there is this compulsion that we have to make and create. And, and I wonder whether one of the things you're saying is that there's, there's too much pressure on emerging artists that if you can't make it early, it's something that's not worth doing, but it's worth doing well, for no, its own I just, sake, I isn't just, it? I guess I get the question I'm asking is where the motivation for making art comes from. And I think that with, you know, on the one hand, you know, it's absolutely wonderful that there are more artists that can live by their work and therefore um, be more ambitious. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, um, there's a curious way in which uh, I think maybe un success is the thing that is given by the world rather than being, as it were, given by you feeling, my God, I've really, this is really doing it. This is really, this has really changed the way that I think about my work, but it also through having made this thing, it's changed the world. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, that, that the degree to which art has been commodified and, and, and now, uh, yeah, turned into an objective exchange, um, I think, yeah, slightly unbalances what I, I mean, I, I want to get back to your original question, which is, how do we, how do we value creativity? And I guess I would argue that we have to value it in the making, in, you know, it's the journey, not the, not, not the, not the arriving at the destination. And I think that that has been skewed somewhat by the very success of yeah. in a way, the transformation that has happened in the last 50 years. And on the one hand, a lot more people are looking at art, but I wonder whether, in fact, the, the proliferation of galleries and the professionalization of being an artist has somewhat diminished people's thinking that I can do that too. But I don't know. I mean, I, well, I, but, wasn't, I'm but I love yeah. I love what Abby said about one of the reasons why creativity is so important is it gives a sense of having achieved something that you can step outside of the stress, do it, and think within I, I've done something. And it's an interesting question for you actually. We'll forget the the meta socio political narrative for a minute and just say um, you know, the displays. There's two two rooms with displays of your work out in it that have sculptures and drawings. And obviously there's a connection between the two, but you draw consistently and have done throughout your career as well as hands-on making of work, but also working very collaboratively. Um, is that process of drawing still, if not primordial, do you still get a sense of that feeling of achievement that you had back in the day that you can't possibly get from working with a team of studio assistants or engineers, it must be a different kind of feeling of achievement or success in that. Yeah, I don't know whether it's achievement. It's not achievement. It isn't. It's just a way of thinking and being and breathing, you know. So, you know, I, yeah, I always, um, this is going to feel like a plant, but I, you know, I always have, now, now my, my drawing books have a drawing of me on it because they, yeah, they didn't sell them all at the Royal Academy, so I got, I got a life, I got a life, I got a life uh, supply of, of uh, so, no, but I draw all the time. I mean, this is silly. So this is me at Pina Bausch, uh, contact off on the 3rd of February. So, uh, so I'll sit, I'll sit in Sadler's Wells uh, in the dark, uh, doing drawings that are barely, you know, barely kind of representational of anything other than a squiggle or a moment. But they're still, you know, they're the, and then, you know, then there are a lot of um, 
as I'll show you. So yesterday, Demetrio Paparoni, who um, writes for Domani in, uh, in Italy, said, uh, look, we've got to do something about Ukraine. Um, so I've, I've got six pages of my newspaper and I'm asking 12 artists to do so I was thinking, what can I do for Ukraine? And so this was me on the train yesterday, just thinking about, in a way, what's happening at the moment. But, I mean, on one level, this is like... Can I just say that's very generous, but no one's got a chance of seeing yeah, it. Yeah, sorry. About... <laughs> sorry. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the point, yeah, the point is that I... No, look, the, the, these, are, these are more... Anyway, there are. Um, yeah, I'm always... Uh, I've got to have one of these nearby at my bedside or in my back pocket, normally in my back pocket, um, all the time. And it's not about achievement. It's about just like when things are bubbling up, you've got to get them down. Do you find that, Abby? Yeah. So, uh, you know, so there are, there are, you know, notes to self. Then, you know, this this is me trying to... Trying to um, I did a did a collaboration with that lovely man, Colm Toybean, and he just said, "Look, look, it's 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 2022, so it's the centenary of Ulysses." Now, in the in the in the fifth chapter, um, you know, he goes through all these kind of crazy made-up people, uh, and I want you to draw the portrait of Herr Hackingkopf. So uh, anyway, I was trying to make up. The look of Herr Hackingkopf for Colum. Um, anyway, but you see, these are friends, and I don't. You know, I mean, I never ever thought I would exhibit them, and then, and then, uh, Martin, who, if you saw that show at the Royal Academy, said, "But look, you should think of showing them because they're sort of a behind-the-scenes look." And so I did, and. Uh, Anyway, there's no end to it now. Everybody wants to see my workbooks. I call them my workbooks. Mm. Well, and they were, it was a kind of laboratory of your mind. Um, and again, thank you for sharing. But the, the, one of the extraordinary things about that show, but also the work you've done outside the galleries, is public engagement, the way that people react, are choreographed, respond. How creatively controlled is that and how creative an act are you consciously trying to implement with your audiences when you you, know, you engage in a city or in a gallery and in that that the way that you did at the academy because they weren't objects to look at they were installations to work through or to walk through well i'm wondering whether you're thinking about one another or 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 indeed making the making of the fields because that, yep. that they're they're both collaborative but in very different ways and I suppose at a certain point, you know, I, I've never wanted to be defined by a medium or a style. I want, I, in, a, in a sense, I want to engage with material, with a line, with a piece of paper. But I also want to deal with, I, want, I don't want to engage with life itself. And actually doing the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square was just a simple in a way, slow analytic process of working out how you could use this leftover bit of um, 19th century, well, early 18th century, um, no, where are we? Mid 19th century street furniture in a, in a, in a creative way. Um, and then one thing followed another that actually I didn't, I didn't need a block of marble and, and chisels. I needed a call center with 68 call uh, operators that would be able to uh, yeah, field the calls and uh, work Book out. I mean, it, was, it was a crazy project, actually. But it was, it was all, that, that project was about saying, us now, how can, how can I make the absolute opposite of a statue of Silly Billy William the Fourth. Uh, how can I make the implicate, in a way, hierarchical statement of a plinth meaningful in the 
21st century. Um, can I make a portrait of our time, but also say that actually that notion of heroes and kings and queens and, and the common people, none of that is going to work if, we, if, if we're going to survive as a species. And anyway, it was, it, was a, it, it was a slowly chugging through. You know, I did think at one point, well, what I need to do is you know, get, in the manner of how many people can you fit in a, in a red telephone box, how many people can I get on top of that plinth, and uh, how am I going to get them there? And uh, at that point, I was still thinking I could make them you know, in, in, in iron or marble or something. And then that, that idea went away and I realized that actually the best was simply to have one person for one hour, 24 hours a day, night and, night and day, rain and shine. And, and then having realized that at the long, after a long degree of thinking, um, realizing it. And I couldn't have done it without an enormous amount of help, particularly from uh, artichoke. That was for 100 days, and I think the idea of it as a portrait of Britain was really interesting, but it was also a grid of time and space and applied by you. I think you have two other collaborative projects you did, one in Hamburg in the Dijkstorhallen, where uh, Horizon Field, where there was a structure stretched across the space where people were invited to go onto it and be, and roughly similar time, but predating it, in Helsinki, where you invited people into a gallery space where there was just a big lump of clay. And thinking about the responses of both, one was not anarchic, but people much more in getting involved with the clay. Others sort of almost ordered in the way that people behaved in the Diet of Holland. But both sort of you giving space, but also, I suppose, kind of wanted to observe people's responses in a, in a way, that, that observe their creative responses to something. Well, I think that the thing that links uh, one another, which was the Plinth project on Trafalgar Square and Horizon Field Hamburg, and may maybe uh, Clay and the collective body, was this notion of how, how can we use the space of art to allow, in a way, the viewer to become the viewed? How can, how can, how can we break down the proscenium arch? The, you know, everything that happened in theater somehow um, hasn't quite happened in, in art. And it's a really, I still think it's a, it's, a, it's a division that needs to be broken. Um, and this connects with what we were talking about earlier in, in a way, just to do with, you know, has the success of some or the commodification of art meant that less people think feel enabled to, to have a go. Anyway, the the um, the Dijkdor Hallam project was quite interesting in relation to the plinth. The plinth is seven and a quarter meters above the main uh, square of Trafalgar Square, and this this large monochrome painting, which is what it was, 50 meters long and 25 meters wide, was seven and a quarter meters above the floor of the Dijkdorhallen. The Dijkdorhallen is an enormous old flower market uh, in the center of Hamburg. Um, that huge monochrome that had seven tons of black paint uh, as its surface was also a black mirror. It was hung by eight uh, 18 millimeter in diameter cables and had a had a swinging uh, motion of about uh, 11 hertz the the point was that this was this was actually a continuation of the same thing a hundred people were allowed onto that onto that great black mirror at a time uh, they could do whatever they liked on it. From it, you could look out through the, the glass windows of the roof of this extraordinary uh, yahalla, flower hall. And I'd had all of the, the, all of the frosted windows taken away 
been replaced by clear, so you could look out. You could look out at the city that you had left. But the magic of the whole thing was that it was actually a demonstration of pure democracy. Your movement affected the movement of everyone else on that platform because this thing was unfixed and it could move in any direction. And furthermore, it was a stretched membrane through which, through your feet, everybody had to, when they came into the diagonal hall and you were separated from your mobile phone and from your shoes. And from that point onwards, uh, you, you, you had to make your way up this staircase and across this bridge and then onto this platform that was unstable, but also very, very, I mean, it was the layer of, layer of paint on top of a very thin layer of plywood. And through your feet, you could feel the movement of absolutely everybody else but you could also affect the movement of everybody else. And if you ran and then stopped, the thing would start moving. And if you got your friend to do the same thing, it would move even more. And it was, a, it was an extraordinary thing. So, so, yeah, on one level, it was really boring. It was this great big flat monochrome. On another level, it was this sort of collective playground where, yeah, adults could be children and children could actually become the professors of how you might or might not uh, kind of derive uh, things from this instrument that nobody it had never existed before, and people had to find out how to how to interact with it and through it with each other, and that was the magic. That that was finally the magic. The magic was that everybody started. They, well, it was it was like here was this flying carpet where you could do anything. Um, so some people did cartwheels, some people just lay on their back and and looked at the at the sky through this moving ceiling because it was it was never still. I fell asleep with your wife. I mean, only in an innocent way. But I, I, I just... <laughs> sorry, I've been I've been selling it quite wrong. It was really just a uh, uh, yeah. It was a, it was an afternoon snooze. <laughs> no, no, it was it, it had been a long night before. Um, we, you, I mean, I. I have great faith in audiences coming to experience art and institutions, but nothing compared with yours. And when we were discussing the Academy show, I mean, you were, I mean, there were all sorts of things you wanted to do. And, and I've never seen myself as a health and safety officer, but you mentioned mobile phones. I mean, we only got about five a day in host, which was the water. But if you'd had your way, people had virtually been, I mean, there were people lean over and they do all sorts of things and, and, and the phones go in. The one thing we couldn't have predicted was somebody trying to taste the water to see if it was um, salty, which given the smell of it, you didn't really think you need to put a sign up saying, please do not taste the water. You'd probably get all forms of food poisoning or a, a virus and so on. But, but you do have this... Um, both facility and desire to let people behave as they as they as they wish or they want in your work within the bounds of <laughs> what's legal, and I really I really respect and respond to that. And the fact that um, nearly well over three hundred thousand people saw that exhibition is both a testament to your desire to sort of make work that people want to see, and the fact that I was able to get them through without them. <laughs> being killed and actually being able to do it. Um, no, but honestly, in, in, in I do volume. have a lot to thank this man for, obviously. No, but, no, no. But, no, no but, but the fact is that um, you managed to lead that institution to do things that it wouldn't normally have done. I mean, we, it took us literally four years to prepare the building to be able to take the weights, to be able to, you know, we had to turn the second largest gallery into a swimming pool. I mean, you know, that, that takes a bit of... Yeah, but I didn't want... No praise for me, but so my, my question to you... And ultimately, was are we more risk averse now? Do you think? Do you think that is a stifle to creativity? I, I'm, I'm not sure. There's, there's always, there, there is more. Um, yeah, the, we, 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 we do get the health and safety executive coming to the studio quite often, and we do have to put those bloody annoying little things to say passed on every single bit of equipment and it, it drives me nuts i came into i came into the design room once fine yeah stuck on the monitor of the screens that we use every day to kind of hopefully make you know delightful things that, um 
are not strictly speaking necessary, but might make them well more interesting. Uh, and it's got this sort of like, you know, health and safety executive kind of past thing on it. I, it drove me absolutely nuts, and I had to go around with acetone and take them all off. But anyway, um, I think that the, the, there's no question that in this risk averse and highly, I mean, you know, we are all in a way, yeah, nanny state or whatever. We we are we, we our what is it? Uh, the laws by which we govern our actions are ever more, uh, yeah, uh, filled with appendices. But I think the very fact that that's the way the world is going makes the need for art so, so, so much greater. And everything that Abby said is true. That you know, if you if you can use that, it doesn't matter. You know, the the the, the whiteness of a sheet of paper can become you know, the infinity of a snowy landscape in Svalbard. It is an invitation for a kind of journey, an invitation to dream with your eyes open, an invitation to, on the one hand, you know, make a mess, to try what, um, mixing a bit of olive oil and a bit of poster paint and a bit of mum's um, lipstick and just see what they do to each other on on this arena, and then maybe even begin to learn from it, and then maybe find something in there that uh, belongs to you. And that 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 um, that invitation. To adventure that I think is what art is about. When the world is, in a way, mediated the whole time, you know, we spend so long, don't we, on our phones? I can't believe it. Even you know, at the end of every day, that you have spent three hours and twenty-three minutes on. I say, how? No, it's rubbish. But it's true. How? How? How did that happen to us? Anyway, I think that those things, whether it's gardening or actually, you know, doing the washing up or doing, you know, when you when you can somehow use your body, your mind, and your imagination, um, I think there is something that you can do watching the bubbles in the, you know, in the washing up bowl that is similar to what happens when you're really engrossed. In, in the arising of something. Um, I think we need those spaces and places and actions, uh, activities, more, more than ever. And it has been, I mean, for me anyway, you know, this, this two years of COVID have been so valuable. You know, this is, this is when the world stopped. Gurdjieff, in meetings with remarkable men, sort of talks about the stop meditation. That, you know, and, and I grew up with that. You know, having to do the Angelus. You know, twelve o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You know, you could be in the in the workshop on the lathe, but you have to stop. You could be playing rugby. You have to stop, and the bell goes, and you have to say your Hail Marys or whatever. Well, that's what it was for the whole of us. I think for 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 our whole species, for our whole. You know, suddenly. Like it wasn't about kind of, I suppose, being productive in a late capitalist way. And what what happened in COVID, I think, is people did discover that that I mean, yes, there was a sense of isolation, but there was also a sense of time, a time in which they could, you know, look look again at their values, and maybe do things that they had abandoned doing. And people. You know, took up knitting or uh, drawing or singing, um, and well, I'm hoping that we 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 yeah grow from what these last two years have given us. <laughs>